works for the MSU N Bioenergy Center. And hopefully next week, through the Board of Regents, the Bioenergy Center will be officially recognized by MSU Bozeman, which will be a pretty big deal for us. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a, what they call a center designation. So this um, the Bioenergy Center actually has one of the only ASTM testing labs in um, the Northwest. They can actually test for uh, the uh, for biofuels, the certified for producers who are selling bio bio and it, biofuels on the open market. So that that was that was what two years ago I think we got that. Uh, yeah, yeah, about two years ago we got that. So that that was huge. That was astronomically huge. So it took a lot of work, a lot of paperwork. <coughs> so. What Randy's going to talk about this morning um, is fuel additives, and we've already seen some over there. We've kind of talked a little about the fuel additives and some of the pluses and minuses and things to work for. So, Randy, the road yours, my friend. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss on what are fuel additives and the classification and functions. Uh, basically, if we're, we're working with biofuels, and we really need this because. Uh, Biofuels are usually have a lot of flaws compared to petroleum diesel, so I have a lot of experience in this one. So to just to have an outline on what I'm going to uh, present today is, oh, oh yeah, uh, we have first I'm going to have some overview of what Bioenergy Center is and what this does, and what are diesel fuel additives and just to classify different fuel additives and just to give some examples. So an overview on Bioenergy Center. So the Bioenergy Center started uh, in 2000, officially started in 2007 through uh, uh, several state and uh, federal grants. Um, basically the most prominent is the WIDE grant. Uh, so we have actually eight lab facilities. So we have the fuel chemistry lab, so we're in, we, test the fuel, certify it under ASTM standard. ASTM stands for American Society for Testing Materials. So they actually make sure that your fuels or your materials are, protect, are, are up to standard so that it protects the consumer. So that's what ASTM does. And we have an oil analysis lab so we can test motor oils, lubricating oils. And also we can test uh, natural oils like camelina oil, canola oil, those kind of stuff. Uh, we also have, through DOE appropriation grant, uh, we have the biomass conversion lab wherein we research on advanced biofuels like uh, cam uh, camelina derived jet fuel. So we have that in, uh, we're researching on that. Uh, we also have a very good exhaust emission and engine performance test facility uh, right over at the advanced fuels building that is new, I think. Uh, we have it last year, and we have the AC dynamometer, which is, we learned that there's only three universities that have that. One is uh, MSU Northern, and uh, last week I visited one of them in the University of Houston, and I believe it's one is in Michigan, so there's only a few, few of them. Uh, we also have a biodiesel pilot plant, so if uh, we actually research on how to produce biodiesel in, in, in industrial scale. So we're, we have a 100 gallon uh, biodiesel processor, uh, 100 gallon per week biodiesel processor. So then we also have oil seed presses. So our goal is actually to have a, a cons proof of concept center. So we're actually researching from producing seeds to fuel, actually fuel uh, seeds to exhaust. That's what we're, uh, our goal is. So we have, Three basic goals, one is uh, R&D, research-based training and education. So we do have some undergraduate students working with us and we also do some workshop and through Stephen Dunn and uh, COTS, we actually have some workshops and training as well, like, like this. Uh, we, we have biodiesel testing in accordance to ASTM D6751, so companies, uh, new companies that, wants to, that have a new product, biodiesel or new biofuels, we can do that for them. And we have product verification as well through engine performance testing, uh, fuel certification, those kind of stuff. So going to the fuel additives, so before I start discussing what our fuel additives are, 
uh, I want to discuss what is petroleum diesel is. Uh, so I, I know you're familiar with hydrocarbons. So what are hydrocarbons? What molecule is it composed of? Two molecules. Hydrogen, Hydrogen and carbon. So it's just, <laughs> it's just that. Uh, carbo carbohydrates is you have an oxygen, right? So, uh, so for petroleum-based fuels, so you, you only it's composed of mixture of hydrocarbons. So for diesel, it's hydrocarbons with an average change of C16 to C22. So and it's specifically used for compression ignition engine, so which is a diesel engine. So uh, in difference to gasoline and diesel engine, gasoline is a spark ignition, and this one is a compression ignition. So through pressure, it will ignite. Uh, this is a a sample of a C18 molecule, this one. So uh, one dot, because in, in fuels, there's really long chains, and you don't want to write C, 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 H, 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 H. So um, basically in chemistry, so to simplify that, we have uh, this structure where in one dot represents a carbon, and then another dot is a carbon, and then the line is actually representing a bond. So when there's one bond, one line, it means it's a single bond. And for carbon, it has, how many bonds can it attach to? Uh, it can form. Uh, eight electrons, eight, eight pair of electrons, so there's four, four bonds. So, so uh, in, in here, so you have one carbon, and then you have uh, one bond here and another bond. So you assume that there's two hydrogen over here. So at the end, you only have this carbon, the first carbon has one bond, so you will assume that there's, to complete it, there would be three hydrocarbons. So, so in summary, this is just a hydrocarbon, one carbon, one carbon, one carbon, and then just to complete the four bonds, you have to complete the hydrocarbon. So sometimes this is, this is what you call a saturated hydrocarbon. So we're in, you have the maximum amount of hydrocarbons, ah, sorry, hydrogen in your carbon. So some of the hydrocarbons have unsaturated wherein you will have double bonds over here, two lines, meaning you're, you're exchanging one hydrogen with a, a, double, a double bond. So that's what you call it, unsaturated, so, so you have less hydrogen. Uh, so it's a mixture. So you have a saturated like this, you have unsaturated wherein you have less hydrocarbons, and then you also have, this is a straight chain, just one line, then you can, you can also have a branched, kind of like that. So it's a mixture. Uh, so why does it have a mixture of hydrocarbons? So I, I'm talking about the chemistry side of the, <laughs> I hope I don't bore you. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, so why there's a mixture, a very large mixture? Why does it doesn't have just one, one element like the C18 or we got, call it hydrocarbon with uh, 18 carbons? So it's because of the process. Uh, so this is just a, actually in a refining process, there's a lot of unit processes uh, involved here, but I kind of simplify it that just like this one. So basically you have your crude oil, so wherein you, you get from North Dakota to Gulf of Mexico, so you have this black uh, crude oil. So it's composed of everything, every hydrocarbons, and even salt and water. So you do, you do have it with, through a first process, you remove the salt, you remove the water, and then you go through, most of the refining goes to distillation. So there's a lot of products, you have gas, gasoline, jet fuel or kerosene, you have diesel, wax, and the residue we're in using for roads. So for diesel, it's actually in ASTM terms and other technical terms, it's called the middle distillate fuel. Um, the, the reason why it's middle distillate is because it's in the middle. So that's the only, <laughs> that's the only reason. So you have the gasoline, which are really, uh, with high, uh, low boiling point, and then you have the bunker oils that used by f ships or fuel oils, which are the heavy compounds, and then you have in the middle, you have the diesel. So this answers the question why it's a mixture of hydrocarbons, because it comes from a crude, crude oil, so you, do, you just do distillation, and then you separate the compounds based on their uh, boiling points. That, that's the only reason you have 
uh, that's the reason why you have mixture. So because you didn't really have a perfect uh, separation through distillation. So, but before you go to the diesel, the fuel fractions here, it should undergo an a ASTM certification. Uh, I've been to uh, what you call this debates on OEMs versus ASTM and producers, and they're really not uh, good buddies because they 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 really struggle a lot on because AS, the OEMs want this type of fuel while the producers like the refineries and biofuel producers cannot meet those standards. So, but they they want that. So, for before you can have the diesel. Uh, or any fuels in the market, you need to have an ASDM certified. So it must pass the uh, amount of, there should be a minimum amount of fatty acids, it should have this certain minimum CTA number, those kind of stuff. Uh, so, but in the process, just doing distillation, you can't really achieve a perfect fuel or a fuel that will meet the ASDM standard. So, most of the time, they, they do some treating. So you have hydrotreating, uh, desulfurization. I mean, like in back in, I think, in 2007 or 97, I, I forgot the year, uh, EPA passed the ultra low sulfur diesel, ULSD. So, 2007, yeah. Uh, thank you. Th thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, so, refineries need to add another process. So it's, it's usually a hydrotreating process where you lower the sulfur, but in the end, the, the drawback of that is it decreases the lubricity of your fuel. So, so to meet that standard, the lubricity standard as well, you need to fix the fuel. So uh, most of the time you need to add additives. So that, that's one of the reasons why you add additives. And, even though you have this ASTM standard pass, I mean the fuel pass the ASTM standard, if you have a special application as well, like here in Montana it's really, really cold, so you need to add more additives to cope for the cold weather. So that, that's, this, that's, uh, the, that's the purpose of fuel additives. So to define what our fuel additives are, it's just a compounds added to fuel to improve the performance and efficiency of the fuel. So, and there's a lot of fuel additives uh, that is being produced and researched and commercialized. Uh, but basically, we can classify it based on its uses or functions into four classification. One is contaminant control, uh, fuel stability, engine performance, and cold weather performance. So these are the four uh, classifications. That handout I gave you guys, those classifications are on that sheet. They're the, the bold ones, mm -hmm. the four main ones. Yep. So, uh, just an example of, yeah, nasty fuel. So it has two layers right now. Uh, actually, what happened here is you have a contaminant, which is a water, water contaminant. Then this is your diesel fuel. Uh, this is dye diesel, and in between, because you have uh, water, you have microbes over here forming or growing. So, because even though microbes uh, uh, microbes have needs two elements, one is water, and then just like us, and then the other one is a food, right? Carbon source. So, and since hydrocarbon, so it has carbon, so it has a it's food, it's carbon source, and it's water, so that's why in this layer you're, you're growing microbes over here, microorganisms. And this could potentially, if you're going to use this in your engines, diesel engines, this will clog your filters and then it, clog your filter, it will clog your filters and then your engine will stall. So this is another one caused by uh, contaminants. So uh, I, I just got this from an internet. Uh, uh, this is a Mercedes filter, so it's really nasty. So this is what will happen if you you have contaminants in your fuel. And then the other one is this affects your engine performance, so your fuel efficiency, your emissions as well. Uh, this is an injector. Uh, I think it's an old one, but it has a lot of carbon deposits and rest, uh, contaminants around it, so which actually makes this uh, fuel injector inefficient. So 
and in turn your your performance, your power, your fuel efficiency, uh, your emissions will be uh, will will be will be bad or will worsen. Okay, so let's go to the first uh, classification, which is uh, fuel additives that will control the contaminants. So what are contaminants? So you have water contamination, uh, you have microbial growth. So what it does is uh, you'll, it will clog your fuel lines and you will have ignition problems. If you have water, it will create some corrosion in your uh, tanks and your engine as well. And, but what's the usual cause of contamination? Yeah, for water, poor storage. So, uh, if you have a tank that is open and it rains, so you will have water contamination. That's the simplest one. And it also, if you have water that's even a little bit of op opening, so it will condense the water vapor will condense on the side of the your metal drums or your metal tank, and then it will seep seep down, and then it will contaminate your fuel, and then that will actually promote microbial growth as well, just like the picture that I showed you earlier. So, uh, so what are the additives that you could, you could use? So you have the biocide, I think that's the first, first one. Uh, the biocide is actually just prevent microbial growth. So water contamination, that's really tough to, to control, if, uh, especially for in refineries, big refineries, where you have really big tanks and, and when you're uh, during forming operations as well, you have tanks that uh, you have diesel tanks that you store in, in one season or a whole year. So it's inevitable that you will have a little bit of water contamination. But you want to prevent the microbial growth because that will actually damage your engine or fuel filter. So what one uh, fuel added that you can use is a biocide. So it just kills the microorganisms once it starts growing or it actually prevents it from growing from the start. So uh, the other one is dehazers and demulsifiers. Uh, this is uh, usually our problem in, in biodiesel pr pr uh, production is we have soap in our formation because you start with oil and you have your catalyst which is sodium hydroxide. So uh, that's the recipe for soap formation or soap making. So the only difference in biodiesel is you just, you don't add water, but you add methanol and you have, uh, you have biodiesel. So, but still you have those two ingredients that could create soap. And soap is a, uh, is a emulsifier where in, when you wash or you have water in your fuel, water and your fuel will not uh, separate, so which is a problem. So you also have this uh, contaminant control, so you, wherein you can separate the water, so water will settle at the bottom, so you can actually just, when you have a tank, you don't want your, uh, what you call it, your tube at really, really at the bottom, you probably go it at the third or, but not to, 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 totally in the bottom, so you don't want to get the water, but you want to get the fuel itself. So, so this will actually separate the water from your uh, for your, from your diesel or biodiesel, so the emulsifier or the hazers. Uh, another one, uh, because you, you can have control on water contamination, you can have rust and corrosion inhibitors. So these are the uh, examples of uh, fuel additives that for contaminant control. So, so this is another picture of a contaminant. This is actually I think this is from a, uh, if I recall it correctly, it's from a uh, train, from a uh, locomotive uh, engine. So they actually collected some samples and they actually found some uh, black residue over here. And also in industrial or mining equipments, uh, one of our students actually was asked by a, an industry and then they asked what's this stuff growing at the bottom and then he actually sh brought some samples in our, in our lab and we see it was really like this, a bl black uh, 
contaminant and from uh, residue at the bottom or precipitate at the bottom. So it's actually a combination of microbes and other uh, polymers that been uh, polymers is actually when your your fuel is degrading and it actually forms a really long chain of compounds and then it will just settle and it actually will clog your fuel filters as well. So, so those polymers are due to the degradation. And the most common degradation reaction, so I'm already in chemistry again, is oxidation. So if, if, if you can imagine when you burn your engine, you're actually also oxidizing your fuel to create energy. But actually that's complete oxidation or what we call combustion. So you use oxygen to create energy or to produce power and, and BTUs of uh, uh, yeah, powers and so that you can run your engine. So that's complete oxidation. So what we're talking about here is partial oxidation, right? And you have an oxygen, it will attack your fuel and then it will degrade. And actually it will degrade through uh, formation of radicals. And you're familiar with antioxidants, you, you buy vitamins with antioxidants, it's kind of the same process, but uh, uh, radicals are, if you have a carbon atom or a, uh, an atom, so you have electrons uh, orbiting the, uh, in the nucleus, right, with protons and neutrons. So well, when the reason why it combines is those, that electron wants a pair. Uh, he, he doesn't want to be alone, so he, he, the electron actually wants to have a pair of electrons so, so they can, can form a bond, those kind of stuff. So radicals is actually just a pair of electrons, and that pair of electrons really, really is unstable and very reactive. And that actually pair of electrons will grab another partner and then uh, one electron with, with the pair will be alone again. So there's another one and then it will propagate and it's still like a chain, chain reaction of stealing electrons or partners, kind of like that. Uh, so that's how uh, degradation works. So it, it's formation, first formation of radicals through oxidation and those radicals will make another form, another radicals and then it will, those radicals will uh, form polymers, really big molecules, and then it will not be suitable as a fuel. It will be just precipitate and it will clog your engines, uh, your fuel filters. Uh, and also it will increase your acidity of your, uh, of your fuel because oxygen, uh, fatty acids, like fatty acid, it has oxygen in it, so it, it, it's acidic, so you have OH, and then when you remove one H, you have O minus, that's acidic. So, so that's, that's another one. Uh, so, oops. so during degradation, so fuel molecules are convert, converted to other compounds, so which is polymers and acids. Uh, so what are the causes of oxidation of, or degradation of fuel? Surprisingly, one is light. Uh, uh, if you have this light, if you store your, we usually see this in biodiesel because it's more prone to oxidation compared to fuel, uh, to diesel. Uh, if you store your biodiesel in a glass container and then put it outside, it will degrade easily because of just the light. So you have the light, one, one catalyst, another catalyst is high temperature, so around 160, if you put by diesel, uh, any diesel at 110 degrees Celsius and constantly blow air on it, it will degrade in just less than two days. So uh, high temperature, you have especially your oxygen, you need that oxygen to oxidize it, and certain metals, usually iron, uh, you have copper, usually copper is the most, uh, uh, what you call it, will catalyze by diesel, easily and even diesel. But we, we usually see it in, in biodiesel. Copper is usually the catalyst for uh, oxidation. Uh, so what are the additives that are used uh, in? Hmm? Yeah, sure. Most of our ag producers, if not all of them, have storage tanks that are made of steel. So is that going to be a reaction, a 
it's going to stop degrading the fuel for the long-term storage? Uh, if if it's not made made of steel, or it yeah, it's not made of steel, which has iron. So you said yeah, iron. yeah. Uh, if it's made of steel, uh, uh, we we have experienced this in within biodiesel, but not probably not in uh, diesel fuels uh, because diesel fuels are more stable compared to biodiesel. But for biodiesel, if you have steel, it will actually we have steel barrels outside, and then. Uh, what we experience after six months of storage, uh, your fuel actually, uh, the, the sides of the, the barrel becomes like, like a gooey stuff. So that's actually the biodiesel going, attaching to the uh, metals and then forming polymers. So it's actually the metals are catalyzing. Uh, for diesel fuel, uh, usually ASTM certifies it up to six months as well. But, Based on our experience, uh, after a, uh, you're safe after one, for one year. So after that, it, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, for biodiesel, it's six months. If you have a really good biodiesel, after six months, uh, it's it's not guaranteed that you will have the same fuel or the same specification as you had so, previously. So you're not you're not selling me on biodiesel right now. <laughs> 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 uh, that's Great. sour. <laughs> yeah, uh, biodiesel. Uh, I mean, even though I'm a bioenergy for a biofuels, uh, what you call this? Uh, I work on biofuels, but I know biodiesel has a lot of flaws. Uh, that's why we're still continuing to research on advanced fuels. So biodiesel is is really good. I mean, there's a lot of advantages of biodiesel. Using biodiesel, one is cetane improver. It, it's, it has good cetane number. Uh, it's a good solvent. It actually cleans your fuel tanks. Uh, it's basically it's a renewable fuel, uh, and also it's uh, it has, actually has a cleaner exhaust emissions. We already tested that over and over in our facility. It has a really good exhaust emissions, but biodiesel still has some. Uh, deficiencies. One is uh, actually the stability. Uh, if you're using like a Camelina biodiesel, the, one of the our problems is its stability. I mean, it's really barely passes the ASTM standards without adding any additives. So, but just like petroleum, I mean, petroleum. If you you start with just distillation, it's really bad fuel. So companies like uh, Nalco. They produce, they research on the fuels and then develop some fuel additives. They have 50 or 100 scientists working in it and then add fuel additives in the fuel so that it meets the ASTM standards. So it's the same as biodiesel. You, you still need to add fuel additives or, uh, or actually if you mix uh, biodiesel with diesel, actually it's it's comparable to diesel, becomes comparable to diesel. So that's why ASTM uh, only allows B20, a mixture of 20% biodiesel to 80% uh, diesel, because they know that if you mix them, blend them, uh, it's, it's a good fuel. Uh, but the only problem is when you're storing, storing pure biodiesel. So you have a lot of problems there. And Actually, in ASTM, they only will tell you B6 to B20. If it's blended, it's required by law that you need to, to display or post that your fuel, you're selling fuel from B6 to B20 because there's some difference from having a B6 to B20 blend compared to pure diesel. But if you're going to mix B1 to B5, actually, you don't need to, to say that it's blended because B1 to B5 blend is actually similar to biodiesel. So uh, I, I went to Texas uh, a week ago, and then I just saw, uh, I think it's Exxon or it's a gas station, and it's, it, has, it says it contains up to B5. It may contain up to B5 so in, their, uh, in, their ga in their fuel station. But actually, you don't need to, to say that, because when you're mixing B5, just five percent. It biodiesel is just uh, it's just the same as diesel. So uh, the only the benefit of using B20 is it has less exhaust emissions. So if you're really concerned with the environment, 
uh, it will produce thick. For uh, particulate matter, it will uh, have 20 or 40 percent less soot or particulate matter, which is really bad. To your if you inhale your inhale PM, it will or particulate matter, it will stay in your lungs and will create uh, cancer, uh, lung ca cancer. Uh, the only disadvantage, and there's always a disadvantage or deficiency in bio, using biofuels, is you have higher NOx uh, when you're mixing B20, I think, uh, an increase of 5% uh, for if you're using B20. And NOx is actually bad in terms of it's a greenhouse gas as well. So, uh, so it's, it's a compromise, I mean, usually. And, yeah? Is there a better storage container? I mean, you're talking about steel. Oh, uh, what would you recommend? Usually, it's the best is stainless steel. <laughs> so you, you sh that's but it's so expensive. So <laughs> uh, what you, what you could do is uh, you can actually just have a, a steel, and then you can have a like a liner. So that's usually what you recommend, uh, just to prevent. Or you can add fuel additives if you're using biodiesel. What would the liner be made of? Uh, I'm not. I need to check on that. I, I'm not really. I'm curious. Yeah. I'm gonna go buy one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I need to check on that. What, what type of lighter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, when you're in Texas, do you notice the, the prices of the diesel and the biodiesel? No, I, I haven't. Okay. Yeah. That's just curious. But uh, uh, what I notice is. The price of gasoline is much higher than, than here, <laughs> which is yeah, which is surprising. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I think there is to almost three dollars. Yeah, so uh, since since we yeah. mentioned Camelina, um, are there better plant um, products? For biodiesel uh, than others, or are they all after they're harvested all about the same as far as well, quality? Uh, for for uh, good properties, field properties, we found out that canola is a good one, and uh, what else? Actually, a blend of different oil, uh, different biodiesels like camelina with coconut. That's what we researched uh, before. Is Actually, a good, really perfect, not the perfect, it's the best fuel that we researched on a uh, blend of coconut and camelina. The problem is, coconut is really expensive. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, and also some research they blended with sun sunflower. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the idea with that mixing and blending is we're mimicking what diesel fuel is. is, is. It's a mixture of a lot of uh, hydrocarbons. The, the one uh, for biodiesel, it contains probably just 10 different metal esters or compounds. And it makes a, that's why it has a high cetane number because you have a, like a almost homogeneous uh, compound or fuel. But the only problem with that is, in terms of one is, you're actually competing with oxidative stability or stability of your fuel. If it has a high oxidative stability like palm oil or coconut, it has a really poor cloud point or cold performance. Uh, if you have cam camelina or linseed, it will have really good cold performance, but really unstable compound. So what we could do is just mix. Uh, blend it, or sometimes we do chemical modification of the fuel. Uh, just like there's a research on partially hydrogenating uh, uh, metal esters or starting material or oil. It, it will have a better both oxidative stability and also uh, cold performance. But hydro treating is, I mean, you're you're adding hydrogen, another hydrogen, which is you, you don't want. It's expensive to have a hydrogen, hydrogenation facility. So uh, there's also, uh, right now, uh, the research is geared toward to producing drop-in fuels, wherein drop-in fuels is, 
uh, your source is still biofuel, uh, a biosource, biomass like oil, and then you're converting it to hydrocarbons. Biodiesel is not a hydrocarbon, it's still a fuel with oxygen, two oxygen at most. So it actually has two oxygen mo uh, atoms in, it com in its compound. So the research right now is actually producing drop in fuels that are special is uh, chemically similar to petroleum diesel. And the interesting part here is the processes that I showed you earlier, the hydro treating, uh, distillation, are the same processes that can be used in producing uh, from oil or biomass to those drop in fuels. So the infrastructure is there, it's just a matter of how expensive your feedstock is. So basically, uh, UOP Honeywell actually had a jet fuel process and renewable diesel process. And I think I, I heard this two years ago from a conference that the cost of producing the, the jet fuel and the, the renewable diesel from oil is actually 80% of it is the cost of the feedstock. So it's not the process itself, but the feedstock. So now the struggle with the bio, biofuels industry right now is the cost of feedstock. So that's why there's also research on finding a uh, cheap, cheap alternative for the feedstock as well, which is biomass based. So uh, yeah, so that's this. Uh, so going back in the uh, fuel stability. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it, for me, it's a, I mean, it's kind of a, a toss-up. Yeah. yeah. Where where there's obviously positive and negatives of, yeah. of both. So I guess you boil it down to how much it's going to cost you. That's true. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. It's a it's a cost. I mean, because there's both positive and negatives. Where, where yeah. are you going to buy it too? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever even been to a bio diesel gas station yeah i think there's there's only there's one in uh what you call this here uh essex but they're selling it i think it's b5 so yeah. but not uh then we have uh chester uh earl Fu earl fisher biofuel so they produces uh biodiesel as well uh, so well, I live a long way from Chester. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Probably not going to stop in there. Yeah, for yeah, that's true. Yeah. So what well, what we usually recommend is, uh, I mean, buy you can really easily make biodiesel. I mean, I mean, most of uh, what they, I mean, you only need a tank and a uh, what you call that? Yeah, a tank and some ingredients. So. But the only problem is you really need to know how to make a good biodiesel. Because right. you can research on, I mean, in the internet and then you can produce biodiesel, but it's not a good quality biodiesel. You'll have oil in it, still oil. You will have some contaminants like sodium, your catalyst, which will, uh, will affect your, will destroy your engine that eventually. So the only trick here is you can produce your biodiesel, but you need to know how to produce a good quality biodiesel. And we usually recommend, uh, uh, when, once you, you produce your biodiesel, it's better to use it within six months, because ASTM only cover it in six months. So, so just so proper- So seven months, you just pour it out on the ground and start it on fire? Uh, I will not recommend that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, maybe there's a, other reasons. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, usually that's, it's a matter of logistics as well. I mean, uh, planning, perfect planning. That's uh, actually some of the problems with when, when biodiesel was booming um, back in 2007. So most of the industry, uh, most of the entrepreneurs want to venture in this biodiesel industry and what happened is most of them doesn't have a good planning and I mean just in business so what happened is after two years they uh, they got uh, bankrupt or something like that so but right now what I heard in the biodiesel industry is it, there's still production there's I think more than a billion gallons a year is produced last year and expected to have a billion gallons as well this year. And 
even though most of the small producers have been gone and producing, I think some of the stable companies are still producing a lot of biodiesel. So uh, in Europe, uh, what I heard is because they have, they have a target of B20, a blend of 20% biodiesel by 2020, and their government actually bring it down to 6%, I believe. So their production is now in a plateau uh, as of now, 2014, 2014, yeah, starting 2014. So you, they have an exponential growth and then it's a plateau. So. So, well, I get calls all the, not all the time, I guess, but regular on um, people wanting to look, talk to farmers about you know, growing a, an oil seed crop and you know, in our climate, it's and distribution, I mean, to get it somewhere to have it refined. I mean, because you always have that one or two farmers that are just barely making it, and so they're looking for the home run. And, you know, you start talking about getting that that harvested and, and crop, to a plant. Crop and, insurance. Yeah. And, and crop insurance issues. And, yeah. well, with Camelina, which I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm super familiar with all the ins and outs of Camelina, but you know, at one point you, you couldn't even use certain chemicals on on Camelina, so you were, you know, limited. So here you might probably have a weedy mess um, of, of crop, mm -hmm. and then to have to harvest that and get that somewhere, and somebody refining that doesn't want to deal with a big weed mess. Mm -hmm. Our, our problem of, you know, refining that. So, I've, I mean, is there, I mean, so, I guess my question is, these these companies, they always make me a little leery that these entrepreneurs that want to just, like, hurry out and put thousands of acres of, uh, it happens to be Camelina mm -hmm. this day, but, you know, another yeah. day it might be canola. Yeah. And you're like, well, I'm not sure people want to, turn their farm into a oil seed production at this point. If, the other yeah. thing, JP, to watch for those is make sure they're a licensed seed dealer. The last couple of Camelina contractors have went broke and the guys get stuck with the seed. Yeah. And uh, so, especially on those, there's not going to be another buyer and it's almost all forward contracted. So check who you're contracting with for your growers. If they haven't heard of them, I'd be a little wary of doing a whole lot because you know, and Chad Lee uh, at the Department of Ag, he's the one that keeps track of that list and can tell you who's licensed, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that, but back in 2009, right? Yeah, and yeah, we're still buying some Camelina seeds for, from those farmers as well, because we're still researching on uh, making bio jet fuel from out of Camelina. So yeah, most of the farmers that uh, we contacted if they're still growing Camelina. They're, they're not growing because of that experience, yeah. So, and there still have bins of Camelina yeah. seeds in their farm, so, yeah. Uh, I think the guys in Chester bailed out a lot of guys that got stuck with seed because they were yeah. at least willing to take it for something. Yeah. You know, because yeah. what do you do when you got four bins of Camelina and you can't find anybody to even, yeah. you know? That's true. So they may not get the price they wanted, but at least they got some yeah. price and got it out of their bin. Yeah. Out of the bin. But then aren't you left with, you know, I heard the downside to that is you're kind of left with, because it's essentially a weed. <laughs> I mean, it's a mustard plant. It's a mustard yeah. plant, yeah. and it just makes yeah. it a little difficult to remove out of your, your fields that once you start Let's go pick up those little issue. seeds. Yeah. 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 I mean, once yeah. yeah. you've created a, a mustard problem. But yeah. these farmers are probably spraying it every year anyway. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be that different than having a mustard crop. Or, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not really familiar with those. <laughs> <laughs>